let's, uh, let's get into our, uh, our study this morning. Uh, this study that I'm going to share with you guys is something that I put together um, for, for the conference. It's, it's kind of a series that we're doing right now on uh, courage to face the insurmountable. Courage to face the insurmountable. And what we're doing is we're taking a look at Old Testament stories about people who faced insurmountable odds and how they overcame and what are some lessons that we can learn um, from, uh, from, from those stories. So I want to start with just asking you a question. And the question is this. <clears throat> Have you ever been pressured to do something that you didn't want to do? Have you ever been pressured to do something that you did not want to do? I feel like <clears throat> I'm lucky, I guess, because although I've been offered some things to try uh, in, in high school, in, in, the, in the public high school that I went to, which, which I turned down, I never really had a moment in my life where I had to really uh, stand up to significant peer pressure. But I know some people do. And it's easy to say no when the stakes aren't that high. But what if the stakes were high? What if you were asked to do something that went against your beliefs, that went against your moral principles? And then to complicate that, what if you had to decide whether you're going to do it or not when all of your friends were watching? I look up to my grandparents. Uh, my grandparents lived at a time in Eastern Europe where they faced some uh, serious pressure to do things that went contrary, that went against their beliefs. Because they were Seventh-day Adventists, many of them were ostracized, many of them were punished because they were, quote, different. For example, my late uh, grandfather on my mom's side, he was drafted into the Romanian army when he was 20 years old. And he was drafted right at the end of World War II. His officials asked him to do some work on the Sabbath, and he refused. He refused because of his beliefs. And because of those beliefs, he was then placed into a military prison for three years. After he served his time, he was released and he went home for one year until they called him back to the military. And what do you think was the first question they asked him uh, when he returned back to the military? They asked him if he, was, he would uh, work on the Sabbath again. And of course, like the first time, he said, no, I'm, I'm not going to work on the Sabbath. And because of that, his officials were so angry at him that they threw him back into prison for a further five years. Military prisons are no joke. Uh, Danilo shared a little bit of his testimony. That was just a fraction of his testimony the last week and I, or the week before, and I was so blessed to hear that. And my grandfather, he went back to prison and altogether about eight years, and the first few months of that second five-year uh, stretch was in solitary confinement. And solitary confinement was a dark room that was so small that you couldn't even lie down. Like it was, it was so small. And, and that's, that was, that was incredible. When, when he came out of that, he was 29 years old and he's, he shared with me some of his stories and, and some of his stories are so inspirational because he, he talks about how he probably would have died in that prison. There were people that were, there were officials that tried to take his life because they just hated him so much. And if it wasn't for the presence of Jesus in that prison, he probably wouldn't be here today or wouldn't be here. He's passed away since in 2012, actually the year that uh, Alina and I got married, but he wouldn't have made it to the age that he made it if, it if it wasn't for the presence of Jesus in his life. There's a story in the Bible that I absolutely love. And the story is found in Daniel chapter 3. 
But Daniel chapter 2 sets up Daniel chapter 3 in a very significant way. Daniel 2 is, contains one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. It's the time when uh, a pagan king of Babylon named Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. You guys remember that dream, right? It's a popular dream. It's a man of multiple metals, and nobody could, nobody could interpret that dream. And not even his paid astrologers, his, 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 um, his fortune tellers, nobody could, could interpret the dream. And the man who kind of saves the day is a young Hebrew boy by the name of Daniel. And Daniel not only tells the king what his dream was, he also uh, interprets the dream with God's help. At the end of Daniel chapter 2, we have the famous declaration by a Babylonian king who says in Daniel 2 verse 47, Truly, your God is the God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. The king was so impressed by what Daniel was able to do that he made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and chief of his wise men. Daniel, at the end he, of chapter 2, he makes a request to the king. He says, uh, King, is it okay if my friends uh, help me with this task? His friends were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and the king agrees. I mean, how could he not after, after Daniel did what, what he did? We don't know how much time passed between the end of Daniel chapter 2 and the beginning of Daniel chapter 3. But Daniel chapter 3 opens with these words. Daniel 3 verse 1 says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, in case you don't know what 60 cubits and 6 cubits are, uh, it's basically 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. That's a pretty interesting uh, dimension for an image. I always thought it was this very big, very muscular man, and, but it seems like it, the, the width of it was only 10% of its height. So it's a, almost like a very, very tall, slender looking, uh, looking statue, looking image. When 90 feet, and 90 feet is pretty tall. I remember when I was at uh, Berman University uh, in the, uh, just in the fall, just before winter, my friends and I, we, one year we went to uh, a bridge up in the mountains that spanned two big cliffs. And uh, it, down below was a frozen river. It was basically ice covered. And we kind of timed it between when the trains were coming and we walked out to the middle of the train bridge uh, sorry, mom, you may have to close your ears or, or mute, mute me for a, just a second. But we did. We went to the middle of this bridge uh, after the one train left. And then we tied up our ropes and, and we jumped off. And we kind of used the ropes, rappelled all the way down. I remember it took a long time to get down. Maybe because I was going slow. I don't know. But it was a very high bridge. 90 feet is a very, very, very tall Thing. So you can, you can imagine this very tall gold image in the middle of the plains uh, there in Babylon. And once the king of, uh, of Babylon built this image, he called all of the rulers together to come and, and, and have like a dedication service for this image, including the three Hebrew boys that were now uh, rulers and officials and, and high up in the kingdom. And the, the cue was was given, you know, when the music plays that everyone was supposed to bow to this image and, and the music plays and the cue is given and everybody does, except for these three Hebrew boys who now have Chaldean names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Some of the rulers, I guess, a messenger, we don't know, runs to the king and tells him, you know, these three Hebrew boys, they won't bow to your image. And King Nebuchadnezzar is extremely upset. Picking up in, in chapter 3, I have my Bible here. If you have yours, you can follow along with me. Or in digital, it's chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. It says there that Nebuchadnezzar, furious with rage, summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, 
is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zithers, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Isn't it interesting how <clears throat> in the chapter before, Nebuchadnezzar is praising the God of Israel. Now he seems to defy the God of Israel with the statement, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? He's so arrogant that he thinks he is higher than even the gods that he is worshiping, higher than the God of Israel. This king was used to people bowing to him. This king was used to people submitting and, and doing what he says the first time. And so now everybody's gathered around and watching with bated breath to see what these three Hebrew boys are going to do at this rare opportunity, this rare second chance that the king gives them. Verses 16 to 18 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter if we are thrown into the blazing furnace the god we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand but even if he does not we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up wow what courage these boys faced the insurmountable threat of death, and this is how they respond. We know that God can save us, those Hebrew boys say, but even if he doesn't, how do you respond when you're faced with pressure? How do you react when you're faced with a trying circumstance in your life, your job, your school, your health, your relationships. So here we are in, in 2020, at the beginning of 2020, we're, faced, we're facing the COVID-19 pandemic. And I saw this really neat chart that I wanna share with you because I thought it's pretty neat. I'm gonna try to share my screen so if you can, <clears throat> come close to the screen because uh, it's a really neat chart that that i saw and the question here it, it, uh, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see that it, is, can you see that little chart there on the screen so, uh, or should i go into uh i should probably do this is that better, better all right there we go uh, okay so <clears throat> this chart is really neat. I don't know, I couldn't find the original source for it. I wish I did because this is a fantastic chart, but you can see here, um, who do I want to be during COVID-19? And here you have these concentric circles. The first one is the fear zone. And look at the descriptions. I grab food, toilet paper, and medications that I don't need. You know, I complain, I forward all messages I receive. Now, I get mad easily. I spread emotions. You see, this is the kind of people that you can see them. You've seen them in the news. Maybe you've, you've seen people uh, that, that maybe you can identify in this zone right here, the fear zone. Is this who you want to be when faced with something like COVID-19? But look at this. From here, there's a learning zone. And then in the learning zone, you begin to, I, I start to give up what I can't control. I, I stop compulsively consuming what hurts me. The, that's food and news. You know, I become aware of the situation. I evaluate information. I recognize that we are all trying to do our best. That's the learning zone. From there, there's a growth zone. Uh, the growth zone, you know, I think uh, I make my talents available to those who need it. I think of the uh, uh, others and see how I can help them. I'm empathetic. I focus on on the present and the future, basically, not the past. I think and appreciate others. I, I keep a happy emotional state. 
I look for a way to adapt new changes. I practice quietude, patience. That's pretty neat. And then this is my favorite part, the spiritual zone. You know, I pray for the whole world. I look upon God's power to end the epidemic. Um, I admit my weaknesses and let God have control. I put my faith and hope to God for he is in control. Um, I practice a closer connection with God than before. Be still and know that he is God. So as you look at this, this, uh, this chart here, where do you identify yourself in these concentric circles? Where do you identify yourself and where do you want to be in these circles? Um, <clears throat> the point is, I'm going to stop sharing right now. If you want that, I can, uh, um, I can share that with you. How do I stop sharing? Did it already stop sharing? You can see my face now. Awesome. Good. Um, so the point is, is that we all have a choice about how we react when, when difficult circumstances face our life. And the three Hebrew boys and people like my grandfather and countless of other people who have gone through similar situations, they are an example to me and an example to us of people who have made a choice. And maybe it wasn't the popular choice. It was a difficult choice to make. But we all have the ability to make that same choice. But I think something that, that is in common with all of these people who make these really, really tough choices is that they have made up their mind about what their decision is going to be before they get into the situations that they get into. Uh, James Allen said once, adversity does not build character. It reveals it. Adversity does not build character. It reveals it. And what's interesting is if you read Daniel chapter 1, these three Hebrew boys were already placed into a situation, along with Daniel, to do something that was contrary to what they believed. Remember with the, with the menu that the king offered them. And it says there in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 that Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Some translations say that use the phrase that he purposed in his heart, that he made up his mind. So here's a question that I have to ask myself, and I want every young person, especially, it's for everybody, but every young person who is listening to me right now on online to think about this very, very important question. What kind of decisions do I need to start making right now, today, that will help me face the difficulties and the peer pressure and the, the hard times in life when they hit. Verses 19 to 25 says, the Nebuchadnezzar was furious. <laughs> you can imagine with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them changed. He offered, I'm sorry, he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then, uh, then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, wait, weren't there three men? Uh, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? Then they replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, well, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the sun of the gods. This part of the story is the best. This is the climax of the story. This is, this is the good news, I guess, of, of this story. And uh, a quote that somebody sent me this week is so powerful. And if you don't listen to, if you don't remember anything else that I've, I've told you today, listen to this quote. It is so powerful to me. It, this is the quote. It was an Instagram picture with a fire on the bottom. It was the campfire. And it says this. Remember, God didn't put out the fire. 
He just put Jesus in there with them. It's not about putting out your fires. It's about who is in there with you. That is such a powerful quote to me. I'm going to read it again. Don't, God didn't put out the fire. He just put Jesus in there with them. It's not about God putting out your fires. It's about who is in there with you. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 is a verse that these three Hebrew boys knew very well because they knew the scriptures. They, they read the five books of, of Moses. They knew it probably off by heart. And listen to what Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says. It says there, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. This concept is everywhere throughout the Bible. And, there, and I think it's so powerful for us to recognize these words and this experience because there are times where God does not remove the fires in our life. He doesn't remove the fires. Even though sometimes we wish he did, he doesn't. He allows us to walk through the difficult circumstances. And if you're in one right now, it probably doesn't feel the best, whether it's COVID-19 or something else. But the best part of today's message is this, that no matter what your difficult circumstances, no matter what pressures you're facing in your life, the promise is, is that God will be there with you. So wrapping up the story from verses 26 uh, to 29, uh, the king called out to the, the boys. He says, you know, boys, come out. Um, and, and they walk out of the furnace. And they walk out to the king and the entire crowd just flocks in around them, around them. And I can imagine this, this, this awe, this, this hush as they stare at these men who just walked out of a fire that killed the men that threw them in there. And they're looking and not even the hair on their head was singed. They didn't, the Bible says that they were amazed that they didn't even smell like smoke. And then we, we end the story with these two verses, verses 28 and 29. It says, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace. Oh, sorry, that's verse 26. Sorry, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship the God uh, any God except their own God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses turned into a pile of rubble. For no other God can save in this way. Pretty harsh. But I think Nebuchadnezzar was right for the second time. <laughs> There is no other God who can save in this way. Here, a pagan king of heaven, a pagan king, sorry, praise the God of heaven because of the witness of three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it wasn't just those three boys that were saved that day. Nebuchadnezzar was also saved. Nebuchadnezzar was saved from himself. And an entire nation was saved too because of, the, because of his destructive behavior. In the same way, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, of course, we are saved. We are saved by faith in Jesus alone. But so too are others brought to salvation by witnessing in the lives of Christians in the lives of you and me, the power of a God who is willing to come to us personally and walk beside us through the fire. What an amazing God we have. Early this year, uh, Jeffrey David, he's the owner of <clears throat> Wave Oasis Bed and Breakfast in Malakuta, Victoria, became 
the international face of Australia's bushfire crisis. After being featured on BBC News and Sky News, as well as uh, ABC on January 1, footage of, of Jeffrey describing the narrow escape from the firewall buried down on Malakuta Wharf, where thousands of people huddled for safety, has been shared all over the world. You may remember this guy. He was in the news. Um, David says that he is devastated for the people that have lost their lives in the Australian uh, wildfires out there. But he is also amazed at how many people were saved in his small town of a thousand, um, including a lot of people who were visiting for holidays when the fires started to bear down on their group that were huddled for safety. That day, that afternoon, that the, the wall of fire he describes was approaching them. He said it was approaching them at su such a pace he said that all they could do is basically watch uh, and wait for the inevitable. They, they came to grips with the fact that their lives will be lost at any moment. And he's an atheist. He, he, he calls himself an atheist. And he says that while he was there huddled with this group of people, he says that a group of Christians began to pray. And he, he says that, you know, I'm, I'm an atheist, so I didn't know how to pray. And I just got this overwhelming feeling to start praying. And so he, he says, I didn't know how to pray, so I just started copying what the Christians were doing. And so he started to, you know, in the name of Jesus, starting to tell the fires to, to stop. He says that, he, quote, we were going to die. If, if the Lord hadn't answered the next prayer, we would have had 30 seconds left to live. Soon he realized that as he was praying, the impossibly began to happen. The fire not only began to slow down, it stopped. An eastern wind began to blow, which should have been impossible began to blow the fire back. And he says he watched, and the people watched as embers from the trees were landing all around them on the dry grass. And the, fire, the grass wasn't catching fire. It was just landing, and then the fire would just go out. And he says that he began to have so much courage that he started to stand up and started to yell at the fire. And he was like telling the fire in Jesus' name to, to, to back off. And he says that the fire began to go back so far that they were, they were saved that day. He says, there is no way, this is quoting David Jeffrey, he asserts that there is no way that that was luck. He says, this is literally biblical stuff, stuff like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were in the furnace in the biblical book of Daniel, he says, we are in awe of what God is doing. An amazing part of this story is that now Jeffrey and his Christian friends, they take walks through his town that's slowly being rebuilt, and they're sharing the message of Jesus to everyone who they, who, who they meet. How did, Je I mean, David Jeffrey was influenced by the witness of a group of Christians who in the middle of a fire were praying to God. And it makes me think, what if, what if people, when they, when people around us, when they look at us as Christians, as we are walking through our trials, when we are walking through the fires that we face on a daily basis, what if they see the courage that we have to face the insurmountable? And not because of, what we know, but because of who we know. Friends, I, there's, I believe there's very little time left before Jesus comes. We could be living in earth's final chapter. So as we close today, I want to share with you a quote. I want to share with you a quote that is meaningful to me. It is powerful. It's from Ellen White in her book, uh, Prophets and Kings, talking about as she reflected on the story of these three Hebrew boys and then 
taking the lesson of that and sharing with us an encouraging word for those of us now living in the last days. She says this, and I'm closing with this quote. I'm going to pray as soon as I finish this quote. It's from Prophets and Kings, page 513. Prophets and Kings, 513. As in the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, she writes, so in the closing period of earth's history, the Lord will work mightily in behalf of those who stand steadfastly for the right. He who walked with the Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace will be with his followers wherever they are. His abiding presence will comfort and sustain. In the midst of the time of trouble, trouble such as not been since there was a nation, his chosen ones will stand unmoved. Satan, with all the hosts of evil, cannot destroy the weakest of God's saints. I'm going to read that again. Satan, with all the hosts of evil, cannot destroy the weakest of God's saints. Angels that excel in strength will protect them. And in their behalf, Jehovah will reveal himself as a God of gods, able to save the uttermost, those who have put their trust in him. Trust in him. I'm getting a bit of echo here. Oh, there we go. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you for this story that we have in the scriptures of these three Hebrew boys that uh, stood up for what's right in a very difficult circumstance. I thank you for the choice that we all have that we can start making today about how we face the difficult circumstances in our lives. God, I pray that you would give us courage that people would look at us, that they would look at our families going through COVID-19 and the other stresses that we have in our lives. And they would not only see one or two, but they would see a plus one, that they would see Jesus walking with us. May we be able to be a testimony, a living testimony to people who need courage that, that are going through difficult times right now. Father, I pray for everyone who is online right now. There is a lot of friends and a lot of family and a lot of people that I miss very much. And we each have our difficulties. And sometimes it's hard to trace you in those difficulties. But God, help us to learn to trust you and to rely on those promises where you say in the Bible that whatever we go through in life, you are going to be with us. You are going to Walk with us every step of the way. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. So help us to keep that promise in our hearts as we face this next week. And be with us. And uh, help us to, to face each challenge with courage. Because of what Jesus has done in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.